at this time, um, I would like to go ahead and call our meeting to order and uh, share that we do have a quorum as I'm uh, counting all of your heads on the uh, screen here. And at this time, I would like for all of you to please rise and join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, looking out in the, the beautiful common uh, council uh, chambers, I do see that our, our mayor, Van der Steen, has joined us. And uh, we are actually at the point of our agenda of uh, public comments. And I don't know if he had some comments that he wanted to share at this time. Not this time. All right. Uh, so now we are moving on then to uh, 1.4 of approval of the minutes. Uh, at this time, would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? You can raise your hand and unmute yourself if you'd like. Uh, this is Kyle, I so move. Okay, is there someone who would like to second? I'll second. All right, so we have Kyle that has made the motion and Meg that has made the second. Are there any discussion points under our minutes? Does not look like anyone has any discussion points. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Whoop. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on now to uh, 1.5, correspondence, announcements, and common council reports. I am just looking over to our library director, uh, Garrett Erickson. Uh, he does not have any at this point, but I actually have uh, two. Uh, one is that I'd like to share some uh, wonderful news uh, that I just found out today, uh, that uh, Debbie D'Amico was just elected to, as the co-director, Municipal Treasurer Association of Wisconsin, District 6. So I think we should just give her a nice round of applause of congratulations for that honor. So, and you know, Debbie, we'd actually try maybe even give you a handshake or a hug or a high five if we were in person, but maybe you'll see that in 2022 uh, um, or hopefully 2021. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Debbie. It just underscores uh, your leadership and your tenacity and wanting to know everything about every single penny. And you are going to uh, really be a wonderful role model for everyone in District 6. So thank you. Um, at this time, the other uh, announcement that I just wanted to share, mainly because I think I forgot to share last month, um, you know how excited I get when uh, the library continues to be uh, so innovative. Um, I just wanted to share that in case you didn't notice, there is still wonderful uh, Mead Public Library merchandise, and now it is a canvas bag. So for those of you that just need yet another bag to tote things around, just think about Mead Public Library. All right, now moving on to um, uh, 2.1, uh, committee reports. And I'm just looking to see if Nancy has been able to join us yet. A and uh, not looking for her at this point. I think we're going to, whoop, uh, someone's coming up the stairs, but no, it's not Nancy. I think we are, we are just going to come back to this topic to see if she's able to come in. I haven't received a text or an email, so I'm hoping she is joining us momentarily. Uh, so with that, I May. think, I, oh, yes. This is Sydney. Oh, okay, yes, Sydney. Nancy did let me know that, sorry, there's an overlap. Nancy did let me know that she got stuck in Madison today and was going to try and phone in at some point, but wasn't sure when, just so you know. All right, well, uh, thank you for that update. We will uh, hopefully have her join us uh, uh, later on in the meeting. So moving on then to item uh, 3.1, uh, 2021 operating budget. And I think at this point, I'm gonna try to make sure I have Garrett turned on. <laughs> thank you, Maeve. 
Um, just a small update here. So last time we met as a board, um, the library board did pass an operating budget. And so that's sort of like the first uh, phase of approval that we have in the project, in the process. And from there, normally it goes to city administration and then on to the council, their finance committee, and then finally to their full, to the full council. Um, at this point, uh, we have met with the admin team that was uh, Todd, uh, the city administrator, as well as Marty and Tara from finance, Carrie Ahrens, and then Debbie and myself. And so we met on the 14th. Um, we have some small adjustments that we've made to the budget, but overall um, it's pretty much intact at this point. We're still uh, waiting for city administration to compile all the requests from each of the departments and then they figure out where their revenue is and sort of then come back to us with any adjustments that need to be made. So at this point, we don't have any major adjustments to be uh, discussed. Um, and Debbie did send out uh, a couple of tweaks um, earlier, I believe it was earlier today. And so if you have any questions about those tweaks, I guess now would be the time to ask it, but I don't have any major announcements on that yet. So if you do have a question, if you just want to raise your hand, I can call on you. Uh, the, the document was, uh, I think, pretty well uh, 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 laid out for us, and uh, I think the explanation of change column has is, is, is been very helpful with uh, this particular budget. All right. Uh, then I guess we will uh, move on, since there are no questions, moving on to capital improvement projects that would be under 3.2. Okay, and for this one, we did. Uh, there is an attachment in board docs that shows uh, four projects that we're looking for support for funding. Um, we, were going, we are using the 850 fund for these, so these are uh, donated funds. But I will go through them fairly quickly here and, and leave, uh, if you have any questions, let me know at the end. Uh, it says number nine project. Um, just know that we had these sequential and we just pulled these out because they haven't done, been done yet. Um, so the first one is staff lounge. We have uh, most of the furniture is very, very old, decades old. Um, we're looking at some new furniture as well as some appliances in there. For instance, the oven doesn't work and so on. Um, right now we do have money from uh, the CIP process at the city that we can uh, complete that floor and the, the last part of that floor that hasn't been done is the lounge. And so there is some money available there along with carpeting and the vinyl that we ordered for the rest of that uh, basement level. Um, so we'd like to finish up that project and a total cost of it is 41,348. Um, next, next project that we have is uh, automatic entrances in the front uh, lobby area. And so when COVID first hit, uh, we had discussions about trying to make all of our uh, areas that are high touch into no touch, such as uh, in the restrooms, having uh, the paper towel dispensers, things like that as being no touch. We also talked about the front lobby area having doors more like if you walked into Walmart or a grocery store where they open up automatically for you. Um, the cost on that's about $9,400. Uh, $9, now, I guess the question for the board as we go through this, on, this will be the one that I'm not as, as strong on anymore, knowing that uh, what science is telling us now is COVID is mostly spread through the air and not as much through touch. Um, I think that this one we could talk about again, but we did get a quote on it. Uh, and then moving on to the last two that we have here, we have steel gate and fence. Um, in the very front area as you're walking by the generator, when you come into the library, there's an area that's uh, concrete, um, it's, it's sort of a little bit hidden in there, but what we have is we have some issues with people going in there, um, especially at night, leaving stuff there and so on. And it's just, we would like, actually like to put a, a gate there as we have in the other areas just to uh, keep people out of there. Um, and then also we're talking about uh, a fence that would start and cover up the generator and go all the way uh, around that area. And then also, in the back along the grates um, where the HVAC exhaust system is uh, working. You often uh, see people standing on that in the winter time because it is warm air uh, releasing from the building. However, uh, uh, since we last met, we had a, another fire where someone dropped cigarette butts into that area and there's also paper down there from people dropping it. 
and uh, they started a fire. We actually had to have the fire department come again. And so we're very interested in, in putting a fence around that area to stop that uh, sort of thing from happening anymore. And Maeve, I did give Maeve a tour of that area. So she's, she saw all the stuff that gets dropped down in that area. We would just like to put a fence around that already to kind of contain that. And then lastly, uh, the number 21, the last project listed is actually just continuing to update the office furniture for the library. Um, we have a variety of, from uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, we've got every decade of, of furniture throughout the library. And obviously there's issues with that. With ergonomics, we, we worry about people having uh, issues with their wrist. Um, the newer furniture that we're ordering is the kind that you can stand up on, so that helps out a little bit with movement. Um, this new furniture also is going to be higher profile. Uh, we'll, we'll order some glass piece partitions in it so that, uh, you know, the, the thought is there is that for sneezing and for so on with COVID, that if there are a little bit higher walls, we'll try to contain any sort of, of germs that would come uh, fly between people, so to speak. Right now, they're very low profile, so there's really no protection. And we have quite a few staff that are in, uh, working together in the same area. And so that's why we really, uh, we had planned on doing that project next year, but instead we'll move that up to this year to get, uh, to try and protect the staff a little bit. So again, these funds were all donated in the past to the library. Um, this was before we had a foundation, we call it the 850 fund, um, but we'd just like to get some support and some uh, feedback on these projects and approval if you guys like the ideas. So, uh if anyone has any question, they can raise your hand. I can share with you that I had a lovely tour by Garrett. He took me over by the grate, and I looked down, and I think there must have been at least 200,000 cigarette butts in the underneath, along with, I counted at least four cigarette lighters and a variety of other paper products. So when, when there is sort of a, a fire, all of that... Uh, uh, lovely uh, scent actually ends up impacting the air quality inside our building. So I, I really think it is a, a necessary uh, addition to uh, keeping our building um, healthy and safe for everyone inside. But any questions or comments on any of the expenditures for these projects? So it looks like nobody is waving their hands. So would someone like to uh, make a motion to approve these uh, Capital Improvement Projects. This is Kyle, I so move. Okay. Mary Lynn seconds. Any further discussion? Uh, Kathy, if you wanna unmute yourself, go right ahead. Thank you, I didn't know I was muted. Um, so we're talking about it coming from the 850 funds. Is this prior to the transfer where the foundation, we're requesting of the foundation or is it still as we control the funds? So, uh, Kathy, if I could, Maeve and I were speaking about the process on this moving forward so that the, mm -hmm. the, the trustees have some availability to have input in the process. What we think should happen moving forward is that I would still go to the board, the tr board of trustees first um, when I'm putting together sort of wish list items and then I would go to the foundation and ask them as well and then uh, that's how the process would work. So I'm gonna, we're starting right now with this project, these projects. Um, asking uh, first through you guys if this is, these are uh, appropriate projects, I guess is the way I'm looking at it. Uh, okay. okay. And, and uh, we did talk to John on this, and John, I showed him these four projects. He said if the Board of Trustees did approve that, then they would be approved. So. Okay, so, so just for the other people on the call, John Peroni runs the Finance Committee for the Foundation now that they're going to be taking this over we're going to have to just do this process where it's really library money, but it's, we're asking the foundation for it because they're managing it and holding it. And uh, to clarify, when we get down to the director's report, we're going to share a little bit about, um, well, actually, when we get down to the library foundation report, <laughs> mm -hmm. we're going to share the good news about the, the agreement uh, in regards to the Mead fund, which was previously known as the 850 fund um, that Kathy is referencing. Any further discussions on uh, these capital improvement projects? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, 
just the uh, expenditure on the new equipment for our staff will really improve uh, just their, their wellness and their health, just knowing that they're safe in their working environment with the additions of the new type of furniture as well as the, the protective uh, plexiglass slash glass shields. So I'm really pleased that we're bringing this forward and deciding on this this year versus next year. So thank you. All right, uh, then moving on to 3.3, uh, digital media policy. As I'm trying to navigate like three different screens up here, I, <laughs> I think it's high time we have a digital media policy. So on this one, uh, I had brought this to the board either at the last meeting or maybe two meetings ago. And the directive was to go back and make sure uh, attorney Chuck Adams of the city had a chance to look at it, which I have since did. And he did actually have some really good feedback, which we've incorporated into the policy. And so um, the policy is nearly the same, except uh, a couple things that I'll point out. So in uh, on number four, um, the second paragraph of number four, it says comments and posts, that paragraph. At the very end of that, he asked us to add a statement that would say, if we are going to delete or hide someone's comments, a, a, uh, uh, someone who's commented on our social media, that we should contact them and let them know uh, that their, their post was taken down and then ask uh, or, or tell them the reason why it was taken down. And so we can still use those uh, bullet point uh, choices that we've got just below that that talk about like obscenity and some other things down there, slanderous, liability or li libelous, threatening comments, those types of things. So if Josh were to take one of those statements down and, or hide it, um, then he would need to contact that person and uh, acknowledge why the, the comment was taken down. Um, and then also on the very back page, uh, this page two, um, it starts off, there's a paragraph that says egregious, and then the rest of that was all added. And Attorney Adams stated that if we are to pull uh, down comments that we need to have a process that a person can uh, formally um, appeal that process, appeal having their, their information taken down. And so the way I looked at that was it's very similar to a banned book or someone getting kicked out of the library, so to speak. Um, we would have a process where the staff would first make the call and then it would come to me as the director and then thirdly, it would go to a board that may would uh, pick uh, a couple of, uh, of people from the, the library board and they would have a chance to state their case. Now, obviously, uh, just making a comment on social media, I hope that it doesn't make it to you guys in the sense that it's that big of a deal. Um, but it, it could, and so Chuck wanted to make sure that we had a, a process in place for appeals. And so that last uh, part of the pro uh, policy is actually that appeals process. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments about this new digital media policy? Uh, looks like Chris uh, has. So Chris, go right ahead. It's that paragraph. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's the paragraph that um, Garrett was just talking about. It said, within any of the following categories will be deleted or hidden by the library staff. The word hidden just doesn't sound right compared to the deleted. Could it just be put removed by the library staff? That's yeah, actually a technical term, Chris. There's actually hiding posts or things like that is actually a, the, the terminology from Facebook. So I think that's where that came from. Mm. Yeah, but English-wise, it'd be better for <laughs> saying removed instead of hidden. And, and also just know that there is some legal reasons that Chuck explained that, um, that we don't want to be deleting anything. In fact, part of the follow-up on this policy is that I need to make sure that the library's uh, social media sites are archived. And right now the city is doing that. We have not, we are still working through our IT department through the city to make sure that uh, the library, library social media sites are included in on their archiving service. Um, but for reason, be, because of that, we need to make sure they're hidden and not deleted, I believe was, if I remember the correct discussion with Chuck. So. Okay. Say deleted as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mary Lynn, I think you had your hand up. 
Um, you need to, you're muted at this time. If you want to unmute yourself, that's okay. Um, this is, I would just, just for ease of reference, um, when you have some paragraphs like that, if you could just have 4A, 4B, so Garrett doesn't have to say the paragraph that begins, um, I think just throw a few little markers in there to, to allow people to discuss it. It's that really a tiny thing, but I just thought I would suggest it. That makes sense, Marilyn. I appreciate it. Yeah, good point. Any other question? Or, uh, Kyle Welton. Uh, Garrett, just kudos and to the staff uh, on the policy. I think it works great. Thank you for, for running it by Chuck and bringing it back to us. Um, I think it's thoughtful and, and comprehensive, and uh, I'm glad we've got something in place. Thank you, Kyle. I know uh, Chuck said the city is going to be doing an update to theirs as well very soon. Well, then ours is the perfect template. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> to start, yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other question or comment regarding the digital media policy? All right. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? I'll move. Second. Okay, been moved and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on now to uh, director's report, uh, 4.1, update on services and programming. And so we'll start off by delegating 4.1 to Melissa Prentice. Hi everyone, this is Melissa. Um, I'll start with giving you some updates on programs. So we're continuing with the low rev virtual uh, ukulele classes. Those continue to draw pretty big numbers. And so we'll be continuing those classes into the fall month. Uh, Great Decisions is back as of last week. It's airing on WSBS on Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. through October 22nd. The talks can also be viewed at any time after they air from Mead's YouTube channel. Um, we're working with our program partners, longtime program partners in the makerspace, Gearbox Labs, and they are providing a series of live virtual workshops on Tinkercad, which is a free online software collection focused on CAD and engineering design and coding. The workshops are being offered both in English and Spanish on Saturdays through October. Uh, this Saturday, we are offering 100,000 Poets for Change again. It's actually the 10-year anniversary of that program, um, and that will be virtual poetry readings that will be live streamed from our Facebook page, and that's this Saturday at 1 p.m. And then looking ahead at our program planning a bit, I know I've mentioned this in past meetings, but we are making good progress at developing an ongoing um, and uh, regular content for WSHS radio, uh, which is out of North High School. We have a staff member um, on public services, John Tully, who has extensive experience in community radio. And he's been working with the staff at North High School, um, as well as some of our staff in the library and some of our community partners to uh, develop some content for radio programming. We're really excited about that, uh, the potential of that, uh, obviously due to COVID, but also beyond that, I think it's a, a really exciting and cool opportunity for us. So uh, that's all the programming stuff. I did want to uh, give you all an update on how things are going with the mask issue in the library. Um, so the last few weeks have been a bit trying. So um, I just wanted to kind of share that with all of you. So we're two months into the mask requirement, the statewide requirement. Um, and what we're starting to see is staff uh, beginning to experience really a high level of stress and emotional fatigue and burnout when it comes to enforcing the mask requirement. So um, those enforcement interactions have increased significantly in the last couple of weeks. Um, we kind of expected maybe the opposite would happen as time went on. People would get maybe a little more used to it and the opposite has seemed to be true. Um, and while
while many of those interactions go fine, uh, the ones that go poorly tend to go very poorly and are um, becoming increasingly taxing for our staff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did start tracking some of these interactions. So, and this is uh, uh, data for the last four weeks. We've had 482 enforcement interactions, and that's simply where we've asked a person to wear their mask or to wear it correctly. Of those, 48 have resulted in some kind of belligerent or hostile reaction um, or harassment, name calling of staff. And of those, 18 have resulted in a patron being excluded from the library for at least, excuse me, at least a day or up to a week. So um, the management team really is, is working on solutions to help mitigate some of these issues for staff. Um, and we're still kind of figuring that out. It likely will be a combination of some additional manager support on the floors, uh, more staff time away from desk shifts or um, having your desk shifts on different floors, and then possibly bringing in some support from Mental Health America or EAP um, during hours when we're not open to the public to help staff uh, deal with some of the stress and burnout they're experiencing. But um, I think, you know, some of this has to do with the fact that we are um, kind of in that no end in sight point. And I think it's, um, it's really wearing on the staff and I think as the public to some extent as well. Um, so that's all the updates I have. Any questions? Well, I just wanted to say, uh, Meredith, thank you uh, so much for... Melissa. Oh. Melissa. Oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's one of those days. So thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for just uh, being so uh, candid and honest in your update to all of us on, on how a policy that is trying to keep everyone healthy and safe, how that is... Uh, uh, how that's faring these last couple of months. And it's, it, and I, you know, as a board, we never want to put together and put forth a policy that creates uh, stress for staff. In, and uh, unfortunately, it, it, it seems as though our policy has done this, uh, but it's not the intent of the policy. It's how our, our, our citizens are reacting to uh, this policy. And uh, you know, the only reason our library is open is uh, we felt that if we had this policy, we could open safely. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, just, I just feel heart sick for our employees that are having to deal with these interactions um, uh, from citizens who uh, really don't understand perhaps the intent, which is to keep them safe as well as keep all of our staff members safe. Uh, so I, I think your suggestions and thoughts of how to improve um, uh, things for our staff and uh, with, with the ideas that you put forth makes sense to me. Um, and now I will just open it up to the other trustees to see if there's any other ideas because, uh, you know, if we find that citizens will not follow the policy, then at some point we may have to take the decision that we cannot have our library open because uh, we are not able to do so in a safe manner. Um, so at this point, I will just open this up to any uh, other trustee who would like to share. Uh, Kathy Norman. Yeah, I'm curious, it, it, it's awful to put this on our staff, but we now have this new resource officer. Can the staff people, if they get any pushback, turn it over to that person? Yes, and they, and they definitely have been, um, but these, some of these interactions uh, don't happen um, when Santino is right there present, so staff are still the front line um, dealing with that. And that added support has helped a lot, uh, but we've also seen an increase in that kind of non-compliance, but also the sort of aggressive pushback um, has gotten worse. So, and, and one of our challenges with our library is that we are the one city building that has more citizens coming in every hour. So we are the one city building that's probably encountering this more uh, than others. I think Kyle Welton, did you have your hand up? 
Yeah, I, I had two questions. Um, the first is, do we have, I, I guess my, my concern is that um, these, is, is there a recidivism issue here where folks are just continuously coming back in and into my staff and the escalates? Is there a, is, do we have the ability to implement a fine structure? I don't know if we're allowed to do that, but I'm just trying to think if there's anything we can do to protect our staff or, or put the directive in. And could we station the resource officer in the vestibule to prevent people from entering the building if they're not, you know, getting through the, the counter, if they're not wearing a mask, wearing it properly to catch it upstream before staff have to interact with them? Um, so for your first question, we do, there are a few people who are kind of repeat issues, but a lot of the folks that we have um, those more intense interactions with, we never see again. Um, I've honestly wondered if it's sort of intentional, if, if they're trying to pick a fight um, and it's just sort of getting the point across and then they're gone. Um, some of the repeat issues we've seen are definitely with um, our more vulnerable patrons. And so there's that push and pull with staff wanting to be more accommodating and understanding, um, but also seeing this kind of repeated uh, problem with some folks. So, um, and we, we definitely have talked about having a staff member, um, whether that's the uh, safety specialist, um, or the managers or some combination at the, at the entrance of the library. Um, but that's not always practical to do for the entire uh, time period that we're open. If, if I could add into that, Melissa, um, you guys have done a good job of uh, part of their script, so to speak, is when they have these interactions, we offer uh, curbside for those folks that want to pick up their stuff outside and they don't have to worry about a mask that way. Um, that is one of the first things that the staff offer is that, that option of getting service a different way where they don't have to worry about a mask. Mm -hmm. Any other? Oh, uh, Chris. Camp. I was wondering if the mayor's still sitting there and if he has any ideas of what to do if, in case other buildings have slightly the same situation. Well, he is walking. He's, he's walking to the podium now, which means, Chris, I need to know which button to push. <laughs> so there I think go. it's. He got it. Oh, there you go. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Madam Chair. Um, no, we really don't have a lot of those things occurring in other city buildings. The city hall has in the past had people coming in that are over at the transfer station to use the restrooms here, and that's really been about it. But they come and go, and there's maybe a little bit more cleanup needed. But uh, we really haven't had those kind of, uh, you know, things to deal with in, in other city buildings. Like you mentioned, you get a huge amount of traffic and, and people that, uh, that sit, other city buildings don't see. And, um, you know, unfortunately, they're not all treating the building and that opportunity to use the library like we'd like them to. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, just one thought that I have, you know, I've always have been so impressed with the signage that has been, you know, created and put up all around the library. Uh, I'm wondering if, if it would be a new tact or a new suggestion that maybe a big sign right at the entrance, just basically thanking everyone, you know, like do the, reward the good behavior <laughs> and sort of like, you know, thank you for wearing a mask. You are keeping our library staff healthy and safe and just, you know, make it really big so that, you know, and, and you could also, and other library, you know, patrons and just reminding people why we are doing this and make that sort of the first thing that they see. It just, it, it, just a thought. Any other thoughts for uh, Melissa? Other than if you, Melissa, if you could just sh share and, uh, and I think I'll probably take a, a, a moment to even write a note on behalf of the board, just you know, thanking our, 
uh, wonderful library employees for doing their best during this very challenging time to keep not only themselves safe, but every single citizen who comes into our building. <laughs> uh, they are really doing uh, an incredible job uh, having to um, focus at, on that, which was never the original intention of library services. And it looks like Kyle had another thought. Yeah, I was wondering, um, Melissa, to your, your point, uh, wondering if maybe there are folks who are looking to to start a fight or kind of make an issue out of this. Do we know, if, do we have any suspicion if there is a concerted effort? I know that there was an, uh, a, there's been a group that's been very active and vocal around um, when the county board had a proposed ordinance and there was a lot uh, that, a lot of fallout that come from that. We dealt with some issues at the chamber um, with some of those pieces there. I'm just curious if maybe this is branching out to other parts of the community and we need to be aware of it. Not that I'm aware of, uh, and I we certainly haven't seen people in in, a, in groups coming in on mass to making a statement in that way. Um, it really has just been individual, so it's hard to say. I do know. Thank you all. I do know that uh, in coming into the library, there are still people who are very happy that you're offering free mass, and they're standing there deciding which colorful mask they would like to have. So, uh, you know, the mere fact that if people don't have one, we are providing that, uh, either dis the disposable kind or, or, or the cloth kind. That is still, uh, you know, something that we are uh, providing to make sure that that is not a hindrance from someone coming into our building. Any other questions or thoughts? I would just like to shout out to the Sheboygan Mask Making Group. They've been providing us with a lot of masks and they do a great job for us. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, then uh, moving on then, 4.2 update from support services. And so this will be uh, Cheryl Nesman. So I only have a couple of things. Um, just letting everyone know that the material return room that was built is completely up and running. We're able to cook up to 24 carts full of items per day and get the temperature high enough to kill all stages of the pests that we're after. So including eggs, which I think is, is really gonna be helpful in stopping the spread. Um, we view this as a great service to our Monarch System Libraries as well, and Garrett has been in talks with them to see if the directors will vote to have us uh, treat their items as well. Uh, and the only other thing I was going to mention was that uh, we have partnered all of our, our pages with collection development staff. Um, to, to help them with collection projects as we test our page liaison program. We're, uh, I've been working with Melissa on that. And we've been, uh, before I even started, Melissa had been talking to my predecessor about um, doing some cross training with the pages to uh, give them a little bit more uh, diversity in what they're doing, a little bit more interest. Um, and just to better our services to our patrons. With, with our current liaison program, I would say that um, one of the goals I have is to uh, get more ownership of our different, of the different areas within the library, the different collections, so that uh, when patrons are going out there looking for items, you know, hopefully they are in better order and, um, and we're also offering a little bit more help to uh, Melissa's selectors who, with everything else they're dealing with right now, um, need that little bit of extra help in, in their selection and weeding processes. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments for Cheryl Nesman? Uh, Kathy Norman. Yeah, so we still are holding on to materials for many days, and I know that's the um, protocol that state or DPI or whatever has given us, but is there any talk of changing that now that we think it's more airborne than it is about touch? 
it's, it almost seems like the, tech, the the discoveries have passed us by, but we're still operating by the original guidelines. Right. So, yeah, there is talk. Um, we're getting kind of mixed messages, I would say. Uh, we're, we are definitely watching the news, and Garrett just shared a video, actually, um, a PBS NewsHour video talking about the fact that it's, you know, predominantly airborne, but then we are still having uh, testing being done for uh, library materials and museum type materials that show that, you know, the virus is still viable on, on items. So we're trying to, <laughs> we, we would love to get further guidance from DPI on all of it. Um, I don't think they came out with any further guidance after round three of testing, and now we are seeing round four testing data. Um, so Melissa and I have definitely been talking about about this as well as with Garrett. Um, right now, personally, I am erring on the side of caution. I would love to just, I, I would be comfortable shortening our, our uh, quarantine period down to three days, the 72-hour period, um, but that doesn't gain us a whole lot, and I'd hate to do that and then have to bump it back up. So at least this week, <laughs> I'm siding on the, the, erring on the side of caution, talk to me next week, and, and you know, more data might come out and, and yeah, we are, we'd love to shorten that period. We would. Because it's not just about the materials not being available or people showing late late materials when they've really returned them. It's also more work for you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Storing all this stuff for days and then having it pile up. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know that we would ever completely get rid of the quarantine. So that work is going to be there regardless. So then it really does fall more on the side of, uh, you know, dealing with, with uh, patrons who want to get that stuff off of their accounts. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I just wanted to share that I did get a phone call from a library patron who is thrilled that she can now check out uh, the puzzles. Hmm. So there's been, the puzzles have been like hmm. in hostage situation for some since March, and so the mere fact that you're allowing puzzles to be exchanged, and you've got a whole plan to quarantine them when they come back, but I, I've never gotten a phone call about puzzles before, so, uh, so thank you on behalf of that one patron. May not be the only one who's thrilled with that new uh, service being reinstated. Uh, all right. Uh, since there's no other questions or comments for Cheryl, thank you again uh, for a detailed report. And I really appreciate your building projects report because it just keeps demonstrating how it's never a slow time at Mead Public Library. All of the list of things that you are uh, keeping track of and putting on hold and uh, gathering more information on. So thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, moving on then to uh, monthly statistics, 4.4. If I can, maybe, maybe I'll jump back for one thing on 4.3 okay. um, that wasn't included in on this. So. Uh, we've been working with the DPW, the Department of Public Works, as well as the Clerk's Department. And when you're on the west side of the library now, you'll see a little bit of construction in the driveway. Um, in when we had a couple of weeks ago, the post office was talking about not being able to keep up with absentee ballots. Um, several municipalities, including the city of Sheboygan, uh, clerk's department decided that uh, they would put more boxes out in the community so that way people could just drop off those items and then their staff would go pick those up periodically. And uh, they do have some uh, drop box here at the city hall. They're also putting one right now in the, in the library drive. So as you drive through to drop off your materials, you'll notice right by the staff door, there's a large uh, box that says very clearly Sheboygan uh, absentee ballot drop box. And right now that's anchored there um, to kind of keep it out of the way, but people can still access it and have been. Um, but the plan is, is they are building uh, more of a permanent structure towards the end of that driveway um, just before you pull out onto New York Avenue um, and and they've 
so far have uh, put up the posts and there, you know, there'll be a curb there and so on. So it'll be just like kind of like uh, the mailbox area when you leave the post office parking lot. Um, there'll be a little small island where you can just drive up in your car, uh, roll down your window and drop those off. So that's um, kind of what that little project is if you're driving through and wondering what that is. It's the clerk working with the DPW to get that project done. So that's great. Wonderful, thank you. All right, now we're ready to move on to 4.4, mm -hmm. monthly statistics. Yeah, and I guess uh, on, on the statistics, we're still running about, uh, uh, you know, roughly 50% on everything. Um, we are waiting, we obviously the, the new mask, uh, was the mask rules extended, but hopefully we don't go back into a shutdown mode for the state. But right now we're sort of running at about 50% for our statistics compared to previous years. And so um, e-content is doing well, but sort of the, that's the physical checkout as well as the gate counts. So um, I guess any questions on any of that? Okay. Any questions, comments on the monthly statistics? All right, um, I think then we will, um, uh, uh, I'm still looking at the, my phone and my email to see if Nancy will join in to talk about the committee reports, but I think we'll just do the liaison reports, and that at the conclusion of that, if she it does not appear, I will give the update from the committee report from the ad hoc art committee. So at this point with liaison reports, uh, 5.1, the Monarch Library System. We will put that on hold until next month when Nancy is here to update us. Uh, moving on then to 5.2, Mead Library Foundation. Um, I just wanted to uh, share that the foundation did uh, meet yesterday. Uh, it was quite the combination of uh, Zoom plus in-person meeting in the Roca Room. And uh, I am really happy to report that the foundation uh, unanimously agreed to the uh, agreement of uh, transferring the ownership of the Mead Fund to the Mead Public Library uh, Foundation. And it is with uh, great uh, thanks to Kathy Norman, who helped with the agreement, in addition to city attorney Chuck Adams, as well as attorney John Hawley to ensure that our agreement uh, reflected the intent of Mead Public Library and Mead Public Library Foundation. Uh, so as all of you are aware, since 2000, I believe 14, uh, the foundation has uh, been in charge of the investments of this fund. And uh, when these funds were uh, bequeathed to the library, uh, back in the, I want to say 70s, 60s? <laughs> Early, 1969 was the first big donation. Right. Uh, we did not have a foundation in place. And so this is a, a really a perfect place for these funds. And uh, I think we will continue to work well with the foundation uh, for the better, betterment of Mead Public Library. As you're all aware, uh, at our last library board meeting, uh, this board uh, authorized me to, uh, uh, to put together this agreement and authorized me to uh, sign it uh, with the foundation board president, Bernie Markovitz. So I just wanted to let you know that it, that, that was accomplished and, uh, and it was, uh, again, just like it was with this board, uh, unanimously passed at the meeting yesterday. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share is with, it's, uh, with great disappointment that due to COVID, uh, the foundation is not able to offer its wonderful Wisconsin Academy um, programming. And they are hoping that maybe in the spring they might be able to do a, a virtual program. Along with that, due to COVID, they will not be doing their annual Yuletide uh, celebration. And the foundation is considering what are some other ways where they can virtually connect with our incredible uh, supporters uh, of, of Mead Public Library. And I don't know if there's anything else I've forgotten, but I'm gonna just look at Kathy Norman since she and I are the two representatives on that board. So it looks like I, up, oh, Kathy Norman. Yep. I'll just say, you know, the foundation has been really blessed with many big gifts that have grown over the years. And so I, I, it sounds like this year we're just, we're, we're not going to go out and try to actively solicit funds the way we normally do. Um, because there's other things in the community that needed a lot more. Um, and we can't really have these fundraising events like the mini golf. 
um, that we had talked about. So I, I think it's a good year for us to hunker down and just try, try to be responsible and offer whatever services we can to the library to be responsible. But the foundation isn't do, do it being an active fundraising mode this year. Great. All right, thank you. And uh, Mary Lynn? Did... Just real briefly, um, I just have a clear sense of how hard uh, Maeve and Kathy uh, and trustee members and board members and, you know, fooling around with lawyers. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was just fabulous work. And I think this is really, it's such a smart thing for the library and the foundation to be doing. And so I just wanted to say job well done. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I think I will turn this uh, to the 5.3 Friends of Mead. Sydney, if you have any update from the Friends. Not a ton of stuff. They did not meet in um, September at all. They did, however, meet in August. Um, lots of things have been canceled. Um, with the Friends, their October book sale is going to be canceled. Um, they want to postpone it until spring. Um, but we'll see, I guess. Um, I, I do want to just point out, though, that they've, they've really strongly compensated their bookstore sales um, in favor of online sales. They've also been very responsive to um, embracing the digital world. And so July Bookstore sold $386 worth of items. eBay sold $595 worth of items. <laughs> and then Better World Books, who they work with, um, sold $536 worth of stuff. So I think it really speaks to the amount of um, online sales that they can do. And then the only other thing that I have for the friends was that um, we found out sort of randomly uh, that uh, uh, um, an item that we had applied for forever ago from Kohler for the mini golf event, um, they had asked for a... Um, a donation of some kind to raffle. And we did receive that now. Um, Kohler has given us a round of golf uh, with a cart at either Black Wolf Run or Whistling Straits, and also included an assortment of brand ex branded accessories from the Kohler Pro Shop, um, the retail value of which is $510. And so that'll be a nice um, raffle item that we can have once the mini golf event happens. That is it. Great. Uh, thank you, Sydney. And uh, if you could just share with them that I really think we have the best friends of any public library in the United States. I am so tickled that they are doing things on eBay. So <laughs> it's just fantastic. All right. Um, I think now I'm just going to do a quick uh, report from 2.1, the Ad Hoc Art Committee. I'm sorry that uh, Nancy's not able to join us. I just wanted to update all of you on what this uh, committee is uh, doing. The last time this committee actually met was in 2016. Uh, so it's been a little while. Uh, but this committee is um, uh, has convened over a concern that one of the panels in our quiet study uh, does not really represent our vision of a vibrant, informed, and cohesive community. And it, the scene in one of the panels depicts the first contact of Sheboygan Native Americans and settlers. And in having this discussion, we you know, realized that we really do not have a policy in place uh, at the library to really determine you know, what works of art do we uh, receive and which ones do we decide to uh, display. And uh, in, in that conversation, uh, we recognize that this committee really need to put together a policy to provide guidance with these types of concerns. And so at this time, uh, our library director, Garrett Erickson, is uh, putting together a policy for this committee to review. And uh, we will then, uh, this committee will then bring it to the full board. This policy will then uh, provide some really great guidance on how we want to address the concerns expressed about one of the panels in our quiet study room. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, uh, so we're at the information gathering stage and, I, and I'm 
hoping to have Nancy give a, an updated report of where we are at our October uh, meeting. Are there any questions or comments at this time? All right, uh, thank you. And then uh, looking at our agenda very at the end, our next uh, meeting will be October 22nd at 3 p.m., uh, most likely in the same place. Although all of you might change different rooms, I don't know, but uh, kind of like some of the interesting backgrounds I'm seeing right now. Uh, you look all uh, very comfortable, but I think my chair is probably the best one because I think I'm sitting in the mayor's chair and it's very comfortable. <laughs> um, and uh, at this time, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. Is there a second? second? All right, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oop, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for taking time this afternoon to join us, and I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the week. Take care.